it's wonderful to be uh, at the heart of Portland's legendary progressive community. Uh, thank you for all the work that you have done over the years uh, in, in keeping up this fight. It is a revolutionary moment. There are moments when it feels less so, and Portland keeps on keeping on. I came here from, from LA. Um, I was in LA last night um, doing a public event, and, uh, and you know, Southern California is still really picking up the pieces from the wildfires. They were on, under mudslide alert when we left. Uh, some communities were under evacuation. Um, and then we arrived here, turned on the local news, saw images of flooded out areas um, and, and highways that had collapsed and mudslides and families that had lost their homes going to emergency shelters. And these are very familiar images um, to me because I've spent the past four years immersed in disaster zones. And you know, this isn't certainly not as extreme as, as some of what I've seen, but it is a, it is a, a disaster. And people are living it um, in the state in, in real time. And, uh, and yeah, it, it does feel very familiar. It reminds me of what I saw in Biloxi, Mississippi after Katrina. Um, or New Orleans after Katrina, or Sri Lanka after the tsunami. Um, so we are going to be talking about disasters tonight. We're going to be talking about disaster capitalism. Um, and it seems to me that it is only appropriate for us to begin this discussion by thinking about uh, these disasters unfolding uh, in this region, uh, in other parts of the country, around the world, whether Tabasco, Mexico, um, Bangladesh. Uh, Oxfam issued a report last week about how the number of these extreme weather events had quadrupled over the past two decades. Of course, we rarely talk about the climate change context for these disasters, but it is real and people know it. Um, Think about how, you know, when we see these images, when, when a community is living through these disasters, what our initial human response is. You know, this is one of the things about, uh, about doing this research and immersing myself in disaster zones, is that it really it exposes you to the worst that human beings are capable of, but also the best. Because the initial human response to a disaster is not to exploit it for personal gain. That's not what most people want to do. What most people want to do is they want to help. Uh, when they see it on television, far away, they want to help. That was the response to the tsunami. That was the response to Katrina. That's been the response in this state. Um, and inside the communities themselves, as they are living these crises, people help each other. They help their neighbors. Uh, I mean, this is one of the great lies of, of, of the response in New Orleans to Katrina. You know, all we heard about was the looting. And people were so outraged about that when we were there because, in fact, there were just hundreds, thousands of stories of the communities coming together and, and people taking, risking their lives to save each other. Uh, and that's what people want to do. And when you go to talk to people who have just lost so much, what they want to do is they want to pick up the pieces and they want to repair. And they also want to do better. They want to build something better than what they had before. Uh, but the idea that they can't participate in these decisions because they're somehow too traumatized or too victimized is, is, is a myth. In fact, people show incredible resilience and strength in the face of disasters. I mean, I met a woman in Sri Lanka who had, was nine months pregnant when the tsunami hit. Uh, her name is Renuka. I write about her in the book. She had two kids and nine months pregnant, and she saw the wave coming, and she ran with, you know, the superhuman strength and saved her two kids and saved herself, and then proceeded to try to rebuild her community. So people are capable of enormous amounts. Uh, how we respond to crisis really is a choice. And you know, the message that I have is not 
one that we are inevitably exploited in the, in the face of a disaster. Uh, there are choices at all of these junctures, and I think we need to, we need to remember that. But this, this phenomenon that I'm calling disaster capitalism is really the opposite of that initial human response that we've all felt. We want to come together. We want to help. We want to repair. We want to rebuild. We want to check and see who's around and what's around and how we can turn this into something better. Um, what disaster capitalists see in a crisis is really the opposite of that. They see this phrase that comes up over and over again in the book, in this research, a blank slate, a clean sheet. They somehow confuse rubble um, with renewal. And there is this idea, and I saw, saw this in, in New Orleans just 10 days after the levees broke, meeting lobbyists and local politicians, and that famous quote uh, from Richard Baker, the Republican congressman, who said, we couldn't clean out New Orleans housing projects, but God did. That's what he saw. He saw an act of cleansing. You know, and I am in a church, so I, you know, I, I would be remiss if I, if, if, if I didn't uh, go back to the source of so many <laughs> of these ideas of great cleansings and ruptures and raptures and floods. Uh, you know, this is a deep part of our Judeo-Christian mythology. Uh, this idea that, you know, I don't really like the world as it is, so like, bring it on, right? Like, let's have a huge flood and then I'll grab a few of my friends, we'll get on a boat. And um, <laughs> to hell with all of you. Um, <laughs> and uh, I think that that's actually Dick Cheney's climate change plan, so far as I can tell. Um, <laughs> this idea that there is uh, there's some escape, right? If we don't like the world, we just need to 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 shock it, burn it. Uh, wipe it clean, and then we can start over. And Marsha talks about the importance of, of knowing our history, and, and that knowing history is, is revolutionary. And you know, this book only scratches the surface of the history that we need to know to be resilient in the face of, of shock. I mean, this comes back to the myths that animate our culture, and the myths on which this country was founded. A bunch of people didn't like where they used to live, they're like, let's start over. Let's find a blank place. Terra nullius, right? No one's home. Except, of course, there are always people there. So they said, well, you know this uh, smallpox epidemic? This is maybe uh, God's blessing, God's work, you know? We couldn't clean out the natives, but God did. We've been at this disaster capitalism thing for a long time. Um, and we are an amnesiac people. We are a people uh, in deep denial about our history, our history of genocide uh, in this country, uh, in my country. I'm Canadian, sorry. We did it too. Um, the, and, and so we don't see the parallels. The way you become resistant to the tactics I'm going to be talking about tonight is when you can identify them when they're happening. And that's why it's so important to draw these connections. History is our shock resistance. Um, so I'm going to talk about a little talk talk a little history with you tonight, um, and uh, and tell you a little bit about. I, I guess I want to tell you. I'm not going to be able to lay out everything that's in a 600-page book. I'm not going to try, but I'll tell you a little bit about how this argument evolved for me and how I how I came to the idea of of the shock doctrine. Uh, the idea that our modern history, our contemporary history, has been shaped by this powerful idea that in order for the pro-corporate forces to get their way, they need some kind of a shock, some kind of a crisis that clears the ground, that readies the ground, uh, that puts us into a vulnerable state at which point you can have what economists call economic shock therapy. That's what the book is arguing. Um, and 
I, I, it, the, the origins of, of this argument for me came out of the experience, Marsha mentioned that uh, the film that, that Avi and I made in Argentina. We went to Argentina after that country faced a very severe shock. Uh, as many of you remember, at the end of 2001, obviously most people in this country were focused, they had their attention focused elsewhere, but it was a major international news event. Argentina's economy crashed in an absolutely spectacular fashion. This was a country that had been the model student of the International Monetary Fund. They had followed the corporatist rule book. They had privatized absolutely everything. Uh, they had deregulated. They had embraced free trade. They had become a country that imported rather than manufactured. They had decimated their manufacturing sector. They had cut every function of the state that helped people, like education and health care and social services. Um, and the economy imploded. And the middle class lost access to their bank accounts. It was looting. Uh, people stormed the banks, pots and pans. You remember these images? So we went there, in part to get out of here. Um, and, uh, and we made this documentary asking the question, once this economic model has been rejected, what next? What alternatives will emerge collectively? Because in Argentina, people didn't respond to that crisis by abdicating power. In fact, they responded to that crisis in a very different way uh, than what the, the kinds of models that I talk about in the book. They responded to that economic crisis by completely losing faith in their political leadership. The chance in the streets of Buenos Aires in this period was que se vayan todos, everyone must go. Right? It was you people who did this. <laughs> yeah. I think they have a lot to teach us, actually. And, and right before, before the, the crisis really peaked, uh, you know, in, the, in, in the crash, the crash of the banks, um, there, there was already a great deal of disillusionment. And the government was trying to deal with the economic crisis by putting, cutting more and more. Uh, imposing a new round of IMF prescribed austerity measures. And there were federal elections. And the candidate that, that got the most votes in those elections was a cartoon character <laughs> named Clemente. They, people stuffed their ballots with cartoons of Clemente. And Clemente is, is a, a very famous Argentinian um, comic strip. And, and Clemente doesn't have any hands. And the idea was that because Clemente didn't have any hands, he couldn't steal. So therefore, Clemente made a more credible politician than any of the ones on offer from any of the political parties. Um, so this was the context. And so people turned to each other. They said, we can't trust our political leadership. They're all thieves. They're all involved in this crony capitalist model. We need to turn to each other. Um, so we wanted to know what the alternatives would be when people turn to each other. And we ended up making this film about occupied factories, about, the, about places where people had been fired uh, from their jobs. And rather than allowing themselves to be fired, they went back to work. Um, it was the opposite of a strike. If you think about a strike, withholding your labor, these, this was uh, people unfired themselves. <laughs> and um, it was, it's quite interesting because um, you know, when, if you think about the tactic, the traditional track tactic of a, a strike, it's not a very effective tactic if people don't want you to work, right? Uh, so this was, the idea was the machines still work, the equipment's still there, we have the skills, we've done this work, we can do it on our own. So this was a really powerful moment, not just in Argentina, but in the whole region. In Bolivia, they had just thrown out Bechtel. Uh, because Bechtel had privatized the water system and uh, hiked rates up 300%. Nice. Made it illegal to collect rainwater. Um, unfair competition. And, um, and really, they, they, you know, in Bolivia, it was at the early stages of what ended up becoming really a national revolution that, that ended up bringing Eva Morales to power. Um, they were in the, in the early stages of that. Brazil, they had just elected Lula. In, in Venezuela, uh, they had just repelled a U.S.-backed coup d'etat against Chavez. So things were really happening uh, in, in Latin America in this period. But across the region, it was a revolt against 
what Latin Americans call el modelo, which is the model. And everyone knows what the model is. It's privatization, deregulation, cuts to government spending. It is this package of policies that we've all been living with. Um, and it was just crashing in Latin America. It was no longer possible to impose these policies peacefully through free trade agreements, through the World Trade Organization, through the International Monetary Fund. It just wasn't working anymore. People were rejecting it on the streets and at the ballot box. So the, the idea for this book came from being in Latin America at this moment when the war in Iraq began. So here we were, and this ideology is crashing on the continent where it all began. And this is one of the things that I do in the book, is talk about how Latin America was the very first laboratory for these policies in the 70s, under the guidance of the so-called Chicago boys, the US-trained uh, Friedmanite uh, economists uh, who worked uh, hand in fist with the military juntas um, to impose these policies. So neoliberalism, as it's called in Latin America, was in crisis. And then in another part of the world, actually in the only part of the world where this economic model has not swept the Arab world, the Arab and Muslim world, um, it swept Latin America, Africa, North America, Europe. I mean, it's basically North Korea uh, and the Arab world that remained protected. Even US allies like Saudi Arabia, 90% of Saudi Arabia's economy is in state hands. These are not countries that have accepted the neoliberal consensus, as it used to be called. So in another part of the world, this ideology that was crashing in Latin America is suddenly being imposed through tremendous violence. And this is what the, in the book I talk about three distinct forms of shock. And those three distinct forms of shock you could see very clearly in Iraq in this moment. The first was the shock and awe attack on that country, a military strategy that was designed explicitly to heighten the disorientation in the general population. What made shock and awe different from the doctrine used during the first Gulf War was that it targets the society writ large. That's, what, that's a quote from the shock and awe manual. Now, immediately after shock and awe, in rides in Paul Bremer in his Brooks Brothers suits and army boots, the uniform of the disaster capitalist. Um, and, uh, and he declares Iraq, Iraq open for business. And Bechtel's tells there, right? Which had a particular resonance in Latin America in that period, Bechtel being there to rebuild the country's water and sewage system. Um, and, and then Paul Bremer passes a series of laws that, that are exactly the same laws that had sent Latin America into crisis. Wide open to foreign investment, 100% foreign ownership of Iraqi assets, privatization. Then he assaults the public sector, right? They called it debathification, but it was mass firing of public sector employees. Um, so it seemed to me that this the tactics of in, imposing this economic model had changed. Uh, that that uh, the violence required to impose this economic model was increasing. Now, of course, the irony was is that before 9-11, uh, the desire to impose neoliberalism everywhere in the world was explicit. Right? I mean, we were having an open debate about these policies. That's what the protests in Seattle were about. That's what the protests outside the IMF and the World Bank were about. Um, but now we were hearing this mixed message from the Bush administration. Economics doesn't matter anymore. Security trumps trade, right? But at the same time, this, the exact same policies accompanied by the exact same corporations were storming into Iraq. And it was economic shock therapy uh, through shock and awe warfare. Now, at the time, I thought that I was seeing something that was unique to, to the war, uh, unique to the Iraq context. Um, but after the, the tsunami, the Asian tsunami, I got an email. Um, I'm on a listserv, the Via Campesina listserv, which is a network of small farmers around the world. And there was an urgent email that was sent out by the head of the Small Fishing People's Association in, uh, in Sri Lanka, 
just a few months after the tsunami hit, I think just two months, and the subject line was the second tsunami of corporate globalization and militarism. And this email described how in Sri Lanka, which had been one of the hardest hit countries by the tsunami, 40,000 people had been killed, almost a half a million people had been internally displaced. Overwhelmingly, more than 90% of them were small boat fishing people who lived on the beach and made their living from the sea. They had been moved into inland camps. And while they were being warehoused in these inland camps, their land was being given away to resort developers, uh, to industrial fishing fleets, and so on. At the same time, and I went to Sri Lanka and investigated this, um, four days after the, the tsunami hit, the uh, Sri Lankan parliament advanced a water privatization law. Four days. I mean, the country is still underwater parts of it from the tsunami. The dead aren't yet buried. And here they are pushing the most controversial piece of this economic program, water privatization. And it was more than that. It was electricity privatization. It was labor market flexibility and all of it. Um, so the, so I, I, that, it was after that that I, that I used the phrase disaster capitalism to describe what I was seeing in an article for The Nation. When the levees broke in New Orleans, what started to happen is that people started to use that phrase almost instantly to describe what was happening to them in real time, when you immediately had this response from, uh, from, from lobbyists and Congress people saying, great, we get the housing projects now. Um, we can turn them into condominiums. And I ha we have a document on the website. It's one of the most damning disaster capitalist documents out there, um, which is the minutes from a meeting that took place at the Heritage Foundation um, two weeks after the levees broke in New Orleans. And the subject, that heading is 32 free market solutions for Hurricane Katrina. Um, and this is, these are the minutes from a meeting that was attended by the Republican study group as well as a network of representatives from all the big right-wing think tanks in Washington hosted by Heritage. And they came up with their wish list. What do you think was on it? School vouchers? Let's not rebuild the public school system. Let's just give parents vouchers and they can spend them in private schools. Um, repealing Davis-Bacon, the law that required that contractors pay the prevailing wage. Um, new oil refineries. Drilling in the Arctic National Wildlife Reserve. Um, <laughs> You know, and what's interesting about this agenda, you know, much of it was immediately embraced by Bush. You know, another piece of the puzzle was turn Louisiana and Mississippi and the entire Gulf Coast into a tax-free, free enterprise zone, right? I mean, what's interesting about this is, you know, if we think about what created this disaster in the first place, um, well, one was climate change, uh, which is intimately linked to fossil fuel extraction i.e. new refineries and drilling in the National Arctic Wildlife Reserve. Um, and the other side of it was the, was the neglect, the steady neglect of the public sphere, of the public infrastructure. It was the collision that we're seeing more and more between heavy weather and weak infrastructure, the neglected levees, the neglected and eroded public transit system that wasn't able to respond to the disaster the failed state, the failed state USA. And so the response was not anything that could be considered sane, which was, let's look at the causes of this disaster. Let's change course in the face of a dr the drowning of a major American city. And I have to say, I think that progressives share responsibility for this, for not being ready for this crisis with our ideas and our solutions, and having the confidence in that key moment to propose them and insist on them vigorously. Um, so the response from the right was, let's have more of what got us here in the first place. Let's have more fossil fuel extraction. Let's use the disaster as an excuse, emergency measures as an excuse. Um, and let's just destroy the public sector altogether. Finish the job, right? So if you go to New Orleans today, what you see is that the city has been turned into the country's leading petri dish 
for charter schools. More than half of New Orleans public school students are, are now going to charter schools, not because they wanted to, not because they chose to, but because when they were scattered throughout this country in a scandal they called evacuation, and a lot of people in New Orleans called forced relocation or ethnic cleansing, their schools were taken from them and socially re-engineered. This is an incredibly anti-democratic move, um, incredibly racist. The fact that it was done in New Orleans, um, I, th I think, has to be seen within that context. Uh, and the largest public hospital in New Orleans, Charity Hospital, is still closed. And those public housing projects right now are slotted for demolition. And I think just two days ago, Bill Quigley, who is an extraordinarily courageous human rights lawyer and has been the leading public advocate uh, um, representing the, the people live, who lived in those housing projects and has been standing up representing them in court, was just arrested two days ago um, uh, uh, for demonstrating against the planned demolitions of these housing projects. So that's what I mean by disaster capitalism. Um, I want to talk a little bit about another shock, um, which, is the, which is September 11th, which is really, uh, I think, key to understanding how we got to where, where we are. Um, I think retroactively, and this is, I think, why this book is resonating in this moment in the US, is that people know they've been living the shock doctrine since September 11th, um, that that shock, that, that, that blow to the psyche of this country was expertly harnessed by this administration to push through policies that they could not push through otherwise. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about, you know, just because I don't really actually have time to go through the historical material that's in the book. The book is actually mostly about how this doctrine has been used in other countries and looking at how September 11th represented, in a sense, a homecoming, where the, the, this, the, this ideology that was imposed in Chile on September 11th, 1973, with the overthrow of Allende and then the descending of the Chicago boys and Milton Friedman, who used the phrase shock treatment in his letter to Augusto Pinochet, saying you should follow this shock with economic shock treatment. And then it was enforced with a third shock, a shock to bodies, the shock of torture. Um, that was the third shock that I didn't get to before. Um, I look at all of these key junctures, how the Tiananmen Square massacre was harnessed uh, by the Communist Party in China to become the super capitalist party that they are today. Um, that act of terror created the context that allowed China to be turned into the sweatshop to the world. It so terrorized the workforce, sent that message of raw terror. And we don't talk about these events within an economic context. We talk about them through a very narrow lens of human rights. And what I'm trying to do in this book is ask the why behind some of these big human rights violations, some of the big human rights violations of our time. And one of the, the the, the, the argument in the book is that in so many of these cases, whether it was Latin America in the 70s or, or China in 1989, uh, we, 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 at, we, we treat these events as if they are simply human rights violations, as if they are the scene of a murder. They're a murder scene. And in fact, what they are, the, 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 the site of an extraordinarily violent armed robbery, that you need this violence in order to push through the economic policies that loot these countries. And that if you're going to rob a country, you do need to use force. That's why robbers often carry guns and use them sometimes. Um, this is a violent process, but it makes sense. And one of the things that really drives me crazy uh, is when I hear people talk about the Bush administration as incompetent. I don't think that they are incompetent. And nor do I think that Iraq is a disaster. Um, nor do I think the war on terror is a disaster. Not for everyone. Uh, and this, this, uh, so, so I want to talk about September 11th in this context. And I want to broaden it out a little bit um, to think about a little bit more about what shock means. Um, shock, 
know, we, we use the phrase fairly lightly. We say we're in a state of shock. Um, we don't really describe what that means. A shock is a response to an event that we can't assimilate. It's an event that seems to come out of nowhere, and it is a rupture in our story. Now, that can be on an individual level. It can be a terrible loss that surprises us and shocks us, and we lose our narrative. We lose a sense of who we are in the world, and we've all seen that, and many of us have experienced that directly. We know that state of shock. It can also happen to us collectively. And many of these events that I'm describing, a hurricane like Katrina, or the tsunami, or a war like a shock and awe attack, or September 11th, what they represent are events that are too big to be assimilated into a national narrative. And the phrase blowback um, is really important to understand in this context. 9-11 was a classic case of blowback. Um, and what makes it a classic case of blowback is blowback is a CIA term, as you know, as Chalmers Johnson has explained, to describe the repercussions of actions that the US government took, but that were covert actions, i.e., actions that people didn't know about by their very nature. They were covert. So when there, are, when there is blowback from those actions, when there are ramifications from those actions, they seem to come out of nowhere because there isn't a context in which to place them. So the ramifications from those actions are particularly shocking. Um, they are particularly surprising. So if we think about the collective responses to 9-11, it came from nowhere. Why do they hate us? Who are these people? It was the feelings of classic disorientation, an event that seemed to come out of nowhere. So shock is, this, is the gap that opens up between an event and our collective story. And our collective story is our history, right? It is the gap that opens up between our collective narrative and when that gap opens up, we are very, very vulnerable. So if we think about what people wanted to do in that moment, what was, the, what was the natural impulse? It was actually to gather. People wanted to talk. They wanted to talk to their neighbors. They wanted to assimilate that event. They wanted to close the gap between event and story. Because we humans need story, right? It's primal. And uh, seeing as we are in a place of story, thought I would mention that. And um, so, so people gathered, they talked, they went online, they went to bookstores, they went to libraries, and they desperately sought to fill that gap. So what did the Bush administration say? Um, go shopping, right? Which is the most isolating thing you can do. It's the opposite of that impulse to gather collectively uh, and make sense of something together. You don't actually rebuild your story by going to Macy's. Um, and, and the other thing they, that, that we heard was that that impulse to look at history and contextualize, try to contextualize this event, was to try to rationalize that event, right? That the, that the very impulse of trying to understand, of reading Chomsky and understanding that the CIA had funded the Mujahideen in Afghanistan, that that was an exercise in rationalization, not understanding. And to rationalize was to sympathize. And to sympathize was essentially to be a terrorist because you're either with us or you're against us, right? So we heard something else, which was actually history doesn't matter anymore. In fact, the message of 9-11 is that there is a new beginning point. We are year zero, right? And we started to hear these phrases. 9-11 changed everything, right? There was a headline. Um, in a Canadian newspaper um, on, on September the 12th, which was globalization is so yesterday, right? All that economics talk that you were doing, all of that is so yesterday. That's all pre-9-11 thinking, right? So our whole economic and political analysis that predated September 11th was just banished, no longer useful. We, we were reborn. We were a blank slate. Um, and because we need stories, because this is such a human impulse, um, we were particularly receptive when new stories were handed down to us with nice little bows uh, tied around them, like uh, axis of evil 
and clash of civilizations and the war against Islamofascism, with lots of help from the media, who also don't like to be without a story for very long, seeing as they are the official storytellers of our culture. Um, so they were happy. Uh, our mainstream journalists were happy to parrot these new narratives, these insta-narratives. Um, now, we know what the Bush administration did with the incredible faith that was placed in it in that moment. And one of the classic symptoms of a state of shock is regression. It is that childlike state that opens up. And one of the things I do in the book is I, is I, is I look very closely at the CIA's interrogation manuals where they describe all their interrogation techniques as a system of inducing regression. And they say that when a prisoner goes into a state of shock, a window opens up, a kind of suspended animation, when they are more likely to comply. And they're more likely to comply because they start to see their interrogator as a father figure. Um, and when I read this, I, all I could think of was Rudy Giuliani. And um, <laughs> so, and I mean, this is what I mean by the fact that we've been living the shock doctrine. We have been, 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 we remember that regression. Whether we felt it ourselves or we saw it in our friends and relatives, we remember it. And we regret it, most of us regret it, although some of us want to relive it, and that's why Giuliani has a base now. His entire election campaign seems to be, remember when I was your daddy? Um, <laughs> but, um, <laughs> so we've talked, we spend a lot of time now retroactively piecing together the extraordinary powers that were, se that were seized by the Bush administration in that period, in, through the Patriot Act, uh, through warrantless wiretapping, through the right to wage preemptive war, the opening of Guantanamo, all of these measures. Um, and that's really important that we're going through this process. But I still think we're missing a larger story. And that is the war on terror that was declared in this, in, in this period. And the super empowered security state that the Bush administration has created through the special powers that they claim to put people under surveillance, use indefinite detention, the classification of enemy combatants, the waging of preemptive wars, the launching of the Department of Homeland Security. All of it actually doesn't make sense as a war. We understand that, right? I mean, we understand that you can't win a war against evil everywhere forever, right? We joke about that. But we understand that from, from a military perspective, this is an unwinnable war. But if you think about it in a different way, it starts to make more sense. If you think about it actually as a business plan that the Bush administration gave to corporate America after 9-11, and that 9-11 sort of acted as a kind of an IPO, launching a new economy, right? That in the same way that the internet launched the dot-com bubble, the 9-11 the launched a security bubble. Because the part of this that we still haven't fully grasped, even though we talk about individual contractors and individual corruption scandals like Halliburton and Blackwater and Bechtel, what we haven't grasped is that this entire infrastructure that we're calling the war on terror, whether it's being fought abroad in Iraq or at home through this super empowered security state, is a hollow shell. It is fully privatized. Everything that can be outsourced and privatized has been outsourced and privatized. This is the end point of the privatization agenda that we've been living with for 25 years. They've already privatized all of the arms of the state. All that's left is the core. The core is the army, the border control. Uh, the core is the running of the government itself. So this first stage was the super empowering of the security state, of those core state functions. But the second stage was the simultaneous privatizing of them. Now, one of the advantages of this is that you actually don't have to debate any of this because it's all taking place under cover of the war on terror, which is, of course, covered under national security. And the Bush administration had a blank check to wage that war however they wished. So we find out about this in glimpses, in bits and pieces, retroactively through an individual scandal.
through the Blackwater scandal or through the Abu Ghraib scandal, we find out that even prisoner interrogation has been privatized. But we don't get the full picture, and that's the advantage of using shock and crisis to push through these policies. They create states of emergency where democracy can be circumvented um, and, and pushed aside. Um, so if you think about it as a military plan, it doesn't make a lot of sense. But as an economic program, it makes a lot of sense. I think what we need to understand is the Bush administration, they're not an administration. They don't administer. Um, they think other people should do that. They've outsourced administering. Um, and the role they have played um, in the war on terror is not that of an administrator, but that of a venture capitalist, of a deep-pocketed venture capitalist that says, that says, OK, here's your, here's your, here's your business plan. Um, he, fight here's your market. Uh, fight evil everywhere forever, OK? Um, terrorists and immigrants, too, while you're at it. Um, diversify. And, and we have your startup money, unlimited public funds, with absolutely no oversight or accountability, because it's all being spent in the name of security. Um, and then it starts to make a lot more sense. Uh, because from a business perspective, what you want is predictability, stability. You don't want to invest in a market if it could end, right? Um, if it could end tomorrow, if this is some sort of flash in the pan war. Um, <laughs> no, you want to know that this war is going to go on and on and on and on. And if you decide to diversify your interests, like a company like Halliburton, for instance, which has been diversifying into uh, the immigration holding business, they got a uh, big contract to build detention centers in the case of an emergency influx of, of immigrants, um, which is actually a veiled response to, uh, re reference to climate change, um, because that's the sort of context in which you get an emergency influx of people. Um, you have, Hall you have uh, Blackwater, which showed up in New Orleans after Katrina, ready to diversify. Uh, after Iraq and, and there to provide security, as they said, for FEMA. Um, during the California wildfires, Blackwater's been very, very present there. Uh, they're interested in getting into the humanitarian relief business. Um, so they're also interested in getting into the genocide prevention business. Um, they want to go to Darfur. But so what threatens this, this whole new economy that has sprung up in the aftermath of 9-11 um, is peace, is that we could actually respond to our climate catastrophe through real political and economic action, like actual caps on emissions, and that we could decide collectively that we want to get off this disastrous course. We could take real action, like saying, the Alberta tar sands, I don't know if you know about this, but you know, should not be developed. I mean, that this is an ex and, and, and you know, we are continuing in this, on this disastrous course. And I know we're going to you know, ha have a lively question period here, but you know, I think it's important to understand that to, to keep the disasters coming, all you have to do is nothing, right? You don't actually need to plan it. Um, this economic model is a disaster. It is a disaster, and it will keep the disasters coming at us without any conspiracies required. This market model that we have um, of casino capitalism, of deregulated markets, will continue to create bubbles, like the subprime mortgage one, and then crises that can then be exploited to push through policies that you can't push through during normal times, like privatization of social security and charter schools and ch school vouchers. Each one of these crises presents an opportunity. But just by doing nothing, just by refusing to regulate the market, you will keep having these boom and bust cycles. Just by doing nothing in the face of this ongoing crisis of climate change, we will continue to have ever more intense natural disasters, which can then be exploited in the ways that I've been describing. And by refusing to develop alternative energy sources and changing the way we live, um, we will have to fight more wars over scarce natural resources, ne scarce fossil fuels. And there will continue to be blowback from those resource wars. So just by doing nothing, 
This market is banking on us doing nothing. And just by doing nothing, the disasters will keep on coming. So that's what we're up against. Now, I think what's important to understand is that what's fueling this economy um, is, is fear. Uh, it's our complicity. And it's, 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 our, it's our willingness to be afraid all the time. Uh, and, to, and that is why a Giuliani figure is successful. Um, the promise of, of, of the state giving us total security, which is a promise that they can't make, especially not if they're waging preemptive wars around the world. Um, that is not a promise that they can grant. Also, the fear of immigrants is fueling this economy. And we can talk more about that. Uh, the fear of climate change is now fueling this economy. I mean, I was, I wrote a column recently called Rapture Rescue 911 um, because I actually, I used to think that what, what, what was wrong is that this administration was run by a group of people who really believed the rapture was coming in their lifetime and that they and their friends were going to be airlifted out of here. Um, and so it really didn't matter. And now I actually think that what they're doing is they're reenacting it down here. They're not waiting. You know, heaven can wait. We'll just have the rapture right down here. And the privatization of disaster response, what we're seeing, leap forward. There's a company in Florida called HelpJet that markets itself, turn your, turn your hurricane into a luxury vacation. Um, during the California wildfires, uh, we saw something that we haven't seen in a couple centuries, which is private firefighters working for insurance companies, spraying down houses uh, for the people who had paid very high insurance premiums, spraying down houses with fire retardants while the houses right next door burned down. Um, so, I mean, we're, we're living this. We, we, were, we were actually creating a, a sort of a rapture context, except for it's not about if you can pray, it's about if you can pay. And if you pay for these extra services, you will be saved from the worst of these disasters. And at the same time, we're creating an economy that is about containing the discarded people, uh, the people displaced by these disasters, privatizing the detention centers, uh, privatizing the surveillance. Uh, so you have the, 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 the privatized containment and the privatized rescue simultaneously. So this is what we're up against. And, you know, I do think, as, as Marcia said, that it, that it is a revolutionary moment because people see this. It's becoming very, very naked. Um, and the fact that there are so few people who are actually defend this on ideological grounds anymore is quite interesting because it is just indefensible and it is exposing this whole era that we have been living in as a revolt of the elites, uh, a class war waged by the rich against the poor, um, a revolt against the New Deal and all of the policies that were put in place so that there would not be the kind of scenes that we saw in 1929. I mean, people demanded something different in the face of that crisis, of the market crash. And, and that was a different kind of response to disaster. That was disaster collectivism, if you will. That's what the New Deal was. Um, and, and this whole era has been about dismantling that process. So it's that naked. I just want to finish with an example of another way of responding to, to crises. Um, as Marcia mentioned, the books come out in a bunch of languages, including Spanish. And I was in, I was in Madrid recently launching the book. And it was a really interesting time to be there because they were just handing down the verdicts for um, the, in, in the terrorist attacks that took place on March 11th, 2004, those horrific attacks on the trains. Um, and it was really interesting to be there in that moment because, first of all, they had allowed their court system to deal with this terrible crime. Uh, they hadn't abandoned the Geneva Conventions. They hadn't kidnapped people and taken them to secret prisons. It was in the open court system, and they had just handed down verdicts. And there were e media allowed in the courtroom. All kinds of crazy things were going on there. And um, <laughs> so it was an interesting time to talk, uh, to, talk to people about, about that event. And people in Spain refer to it as their 9-11. Um, but they reacted to it completely differently. And, and I just want to remind you, because I think some of you remember and some of you prob probably don't. Um, the day after those attacks, um, 
Well, immediately, immediately after the attacks, actually, Spain at the time had a very right-wing president named Jose Maria Aznar, a big Bush ally, went into Iraq with Bush against the wishes of his people. Um, immediately after the attack, Aznar just started doing his best Bush impersonation, um, which meant using the attack instantly to political advantage, just nakedly. He blamed ETA, the Basque separatists, um, with no evidence whatsoever. And then he also said, and this is why we're in Iraq, because these people want to take away our freedom, which made no sense. I mean, if it was ETA, then what does it have to do with Iraq? But it was, you know, the free association Bush style. And, um, <laughs> and so people were watching this, and the, the response was, was instant. The day after the attacks, Spaniards took to the streets in huge demonstrations. And it's really important to remember how frightening it was to do that in this moment. They didn't know who was behind the attacks, and they were still out there. Uh, and so the idea of people gathering, I mean, when you gather together, you're a target, right? Um, and so it was in defiance of fear that people gathered. And in fact, they described the marches as marches not against Aznar, but marches against fear. And it's very interesting, if you think about that idea, to have a march against an emotion. Um, your emotion, right? An emotion within yourself, identifying the enemy within. Uh, and the enemy within is fear. Um, and, and then it just so happened, uh, lucky them, that they were having elections the next day, the day after that. Um, and people were able to instantly act on their rejection and, and, and their disgust at the way these events were being exploited. And they voted overwhelmingly against Aznar's party and voted in Zapatero, who was promising, running on a platform of pulling troops out of Iraq. And they did pull troops out of Iraq. Um, imagine that. And, uh, um, so, so when we were when we were in Spain, I, I asked a lot of people, you know, why was it that that, that people responded so spontaneously, so you know, without any organization, so powerfully to to, to what Aznar was doing? And we got the same answer again and again. He reminded us, Aznar reminded us of Franco. Um, and so you know what what's so, what's so interesting about that story I, to me is. It's first of all that they identified fear as their enemy, um, and even though they had every reason to be afraid, right? There is no guarantee. None of us are guaranteed a life without fear. <laughs> the idea of security is a myth. None of us get it. Um, and they gathered because they knew there was strength in numbers. They knew they would be stronger together than apart. Uh, and what allowed them to do this was their collective knowledge of history, their collective metabolizing of a past of terror. And more than that, that they had done, that Spaniards had done the hard work of history, right? Uh, that they weren't living with fairy tale, the fairy tale version of history. They were remembering their own complicity, their own collective complicity with the Franco regime, remembering how in an earlier era they and their parents and grandparents, some of them, had given into that desire for security and given up their democracy in the process. And so because they had done that work of history, they didn't lose their story. They had a story in that moment of crisis. They didn't go into shock. It was shocking, but they didn't go into shock. They had that collective story. Um, and. And it was history, really, that, that saved them. Um, so as we think about how we can be shock resistant, we know we can't keep the shocks from coming. But we don't have to regress. We don't have to give in to our fear. We can study history. And that will allow us to recognize patterns instantly. It's our roadmap. And we will see the early warning signs instantly, and we will be able to react, and we'll be able to resist. Um, so I want to thank you very much. I've talked a long time, but we still have time for questions. Um, history is, is our story. It's our shock resistance. So thank you for remembering a little bit with me tonight. <laughs>